Good morning, church family. I want to welcome you to worship this Father's Day weekend. And thank you for joining us in our online worship service. This week, as I mentioned, we are celebrating Father's Day. And on behalf of the leadership team at Grace Gospel, I want to wish all of you fathers happy Father's Day. Let us start by reading a verse in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father. And as a believer, as Christians, we have the ultimate example of what fatherhood is in our Heavenly Father. As a dad, as a father, I am thankful that I have the Word of God to guide me and direct me, as I am responsible for little lives on a daily basis. And I thank the Lord that he's equipped us to be men and to be good fathers. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. We thank you, Father, for your involvement in our lives. The great creator and all-powerful God of the universe takes the time to instruct and lead and guide us through the power of your spirit and through the righteous, holy teachings of your word. Lord, we thank you for your involvement in our lives. We thank you that you've called us men uh, who have children to be dads, to be fathers, and that comes with responsibility. And Lord, this Father's Day weekend, we take some time to acknowledge the position of father that you've created, and we thank you that you are the ultimate example. And we just pray for strength and encouragement as we endeavor to follow you. Lord, as we worship corporately uh, this weekend, Father, I would ask and pray that you would draw us closer to you. Father, all the situations that are before us in life, Lord, may we be reminded that you are sovereignly God on the throne, but you are our approachable Heavenly Father. And as we think of Father's Day, may our thoughts be first and foremost drawn to you, our Father. Bless us now as we worship. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, church family, as we continue on in the service, I just uh, encourage you to stay to the end. I know Pastor Terry has some uh, special things planned for the end of this video. And I just pray now uh, as we gather and worship that you will be uplifted. And God bless you. Daddy, I love you because you encourage me when I'm running. I love you, Daddy, because you help me. Daddy, I love you because my because you help me and um and make sure now I'm not in the middle of the road. I love my daddy because he makes me laugh and he plays Minecraft with me and my brothers all the time. And because um, I like cuddling him. My dad is the best because we used to go to st um, out to Starbucks when um, it was morning well, when it was dark outside and we had hot chocolate and banana bread together. Dad, we cut and take me on track rides and 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 
teaching me how to use tools. I just want to take a moment and wish my dad Happy Father's Day. I want to thank him for the example that he's always set uh, in faith and in life, and thank him for the example of serving the Lord. Even to this day, uh, my dad will step up and serve, and he continues to be an example to me and to my children. God bless you, Dad. Happy Father's Day, and thanks for your heart for the Lord. Happy Father's Day to you both, to my dad, Peter Morocco, and Larry Warren. I love you guys very much. Hopefully we can start fishing again. I love you both. I grew up watching my dad. Uh, he was the DIY guy with all the fixer-uppers we had. I learned that there was no job too big to tackle. He kept his sons busy, you know, whether it's mowing the lawn or, you know, chores around the house or helping work with uh, the, you know, projects and home improvement. Every fall we'd have to get eight quart of wood, eight to ten quart to uh, heat the house, and so yeah, we were busy, you know, cutting that into lengths with chainsaws and splitting it with a wood splitter or the wedge and hammer or axe and then carrying it up the hill and into the basement and stacking it up for the winter. <laughs> My dad used to tell us that uh, you know there were guys who would work out in the gym but they couldn't do the work we did because their muscles were just for show. <laughs> so thanks dad, thanks for the life skills and, and the hard work ethic you gave us and for being a good example to your sons. Happy Father's Day. One of the skills that my father taught me was fishing and I've been able to pass that on to the students of our youth ministry over the years and I get to pass it on to my son right now. The other skill he also taught me was how to swim. Well, hello everyone, welcome to worship. It's good to be with you again. Um, we're going to open today's service with, uh, with a song that many of you probably have not yet heard. This is a song that Alicia and I, when we were worship leaders at Redeemer, just loved to play uh, to open our services. It's called Rejoice, and it's a great song that sings of the, the power of God, but also the fatherly love that he has for us. So as you feel comfortable, we'd love if you joined with us and sang. Stand before your Maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the One who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice. Sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting Bought with sacrificial blood Bringing reconciliation To a world that longs to know The affections of a father Who will never let 
let them go Rejoice Come and lift your hands And raise your voice He is worthy of all praise Rejoice Sing the mercies of your King And with trembling Rejoice All our sin and all our sorrow Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. He's turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him. He hears your voice. midst of suffering, He will help you sing. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King.
that shall lose me I will say, oh I will say Till the day that death shall lose me I will say, oh I will say Road to wander, Lord I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, dads, I hope you feel uh, adequately celebrated on this Father's Day. And those of you who are thinking about your dads today, uh, whatever legacy uh, they have left for you to honor them or to learn from them, let me just actually put you on notice this morning. I'm going to do things a little bit differently because often, I don't know, I found a pattern in churches that, you know, Mother's Day, you know, the mothers just get honored and, and pampered a little bit as they should. But uh, it seems like on Father's Day, the fathers get beat up a little bit, you know, and typically dads are just getting chewed out for not spending enough time with the family, not being, you know, maybe being spiritual deadbeats. I, I think no wonder a lot of men don't want to come to church. So uh, I'm just going to get this little ritual over with, okay? You, you ready? Dudes, spend more time with your family, and, and don't be a spiritual wimp. It's time to, you know, to love and to lead. You got it? Phew, I feel a whole lot better now, don't you? No, seriously, men, we, uh, we need some uplifting, just like the ladies, right? Fact is, God has made men differently than women. I mean, phone conversations, they could be over with like 30 seconds flat. Uh, a five-day holiday requir requires only one suitcase. When you're clicking through those TV channels, you don't have to stop at every shot of someone crying. You know, car mechanics will probably tell you the truth. Gray hair, wrinkles, you know, they only add character to men. And you know, if a guy shows up at a party wearing the same thing as you, you probably will become lifelong buddies. And uh, the occasional well-rendered <coughs> belch is practically expected. And fathers, you know what, we just need encouragement because while it's a tremendous calling uh, in the design of God for families, fathering is also difficult. And sometimes it's underappreciated. One father related a time when on Sunday morning at church and his young son David, about five, uh, uh, was there with him and it was common for the pastor to have this little story time uh, a little lesson for the children uh, before um, they went downstairs and so he'd bring uh, this item that uh, they could uh, find around the house and just relate it to some teaching in the Bible well that happened to be fire safety week in October and the visual aid for the lesson was a smoke detector and and so the the pastor asked the children if they knew what that meant and if the alarm sounded from the smoke detector and little David immediately raised his hand and said yeah it means death Daddy's cooking dinner. Poor dad. You know, friends, we could search the scriptures to find, you know, many different places in the Bible for an example uh, for godly fathers. Uh, for those of us doing the Bible reading challenge, you probably would say with me that that would be quite a challenge to find that kind of godly example. I mean, men were uh, as imperfect in the record of scriptures as they are in our time. But that doesn't mean um, that we never get it right, right? I mean, we are, as the fairer sex are, we're, we're works in progress. There are many great examples of godly men and women in the Bible, but not men particularly in their roles as fathers. So I hope it's not going to uh, upset you today that the dad that we're going to look at in the Bible is described in a parable, a, a story told by Jesus, a story with many lessons in it. And that's not to say that being a godly father is an imaginary thing. Many of us have gained from good examples, even great examples. We're going to see some glimpses of them through the example of this particular father. He's an unnamed father. He's got two boys. It's in Luke chapter 15. One of those boys is nicknamed the prodigal. So you're familiar with the story. Let's hear it as Patrick reads it for us. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. 
So he divided his property between them. Not long after, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in, a wi in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were feeding, but he had, uh, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, they re he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because because he has given back, back safe, because he has got back safe and sound. The other brother, the other, the older brother became angry and refused to go to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, "Look, all these years I have been slaving for you, and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never." gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But, he ha but we have to celebrate and be glad because your brother was yours, of yours was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. Thanks, Patrick and Rosie. Um, the father uh, that we get a picture of in this familiar story, he's a, he's a good father. In fact, he's a perfect father, because as Jesus is telling the story, he's really painting a picture for us of our Father who's in heaven. And yet the story is told in the image of an earthly father, a dad, a dad like us dads. Um, many of us knew a good father, probably not a perfect one, uh, but this is a, a good day to affirm some of the good things that fathers are about. For us guys who need that shot in the arm just to improve our craft a bit as dads, uh, for others who can maybe just help encourage the best in our dads uh, and just learn to be godly men, 
Um, Pastor Melvin Newland provides five characteristics of this particular father that I've adapted now as we're going to look into the story of Luke chapter 15. First, that this father provided for the basic needs of his family. Uh, this father was actually, you know, obviously quite well to do, um, you know, to have given an inheritance as large as he did to his younger son so he could just enjoy uh, an extravagant lifestyle for a period of time. Came back home, got a gold ring put on his finger, have servants kill and prepare a fattened calf and musicians and a big celebration when he came home. I mean, he must have had plenty of disposable income. Obviously, this father wasn't miserly. He neither was wasteful. His family didn't suffer. He was blessed with the means to provide. And, and that's just part of the job. Uh, that every father has to provide for his family to make sure there's food and shelter and clothing and some dads maybe have to do without so that their kids and their family can have after all a test of a man's fatherly character is not going to be in the tools and the toys that he accumulates right but as as Paul writes in 1st Timothy 5 verse 8 he says this if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever Wow so it's our job as fathers to provide. Now that can be a little daunting. The cost of living these days uh, can make most of us as men anxious about what it takes to actually provide for a family. How much does it cost to, to raise a child from diapers to braces and then you know, through to grade 12 graduation? Uh, a 2011 article that appeared in the Canadian publication Money Sense uh, placed the estimate at $12,824 a year. That adds up to $243,656 over those 18 years. That would be like over $14,000 a year now when we factor in the inflation, meaning like over $250,000 per child. That doesn't include many of the things that may be on their wish list. And going to Disney is certainly not a rite of passage for families. So this is really just about their regular care, uh, maybe meaningful recreation in their development and their education. But frankly, I mean, that much money, that would help pay for a pretty nice house, a mansion if you had four kids like we had. And so you might look at your kids and say, well, there goes our luxury home. That's a lot of money, isn't it? And that's the reason maybe it's said that dad's the guy with a wallet full of pictures where there used to be money. Uh, they used to say that the greatest number of long distance phone calls was uh, made on Mother's Day. However, the greatest number of collect calls were made on Father's Day. Of course, that's all changed with today's technology. But, you know, there's always something being pulled out of dad's wallet if he is the primary earner in the home. Uh, so we have to get used to that, right? And yet for this son in, in Luke chapter 15, that wasn't enough. Let me encourage any of us who still have that connection with our dads. If, uh, you know, if you're critical of your dad because you thought maybe he didn't provide enough toys for you. Uh, he, you thought he didn't give you all the opportunities that the other kids had, or you thought that, uh, you know, he didn't buy you the clothes that you wanted. And you, you thought you, you didn't go to all those places that you'd really want to go to. Maybe you just need to pause and, and on father's day and say, Hey dad, you know, thanks for being a good provider. Um, because that's what dads are called to do. Maybe not for all of our wants, but, uh, but certainly to be used of God to help provide for the needs. Well, this dad in Luke 15, I mean, he, he, was, he was also generous. He was generous beyond what could have been reasonably expected of him. Look at verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Wow. I mean, here's a boy like, you know, 17, 18, 19, comes to his dad and says, Dad, you know, I've done some calculating and uh, I've come to the conclusion that when I die, um, you're going to owe me about 250,000 bucks. So I'm tired of waiting until you die. I want my share right now. And if some of us younger men are thinking, well, hey, hmm, not a bad idea. I wonder how much my dad's got. Man, what could I do with that, right? I'll just, let me pull you into reality here. That son was not exactly commended for this action. In fact, he's saying, because he's saying like, dad, I wish you were dead so I could get what's mine and get out of here. 
And a traditional Middle Eastern father at that point would strike the boy across the face and drive him out of the house with maybe the clothes on his back. Just about anywhere in the world, this would have been an outrageous request. In the culture of this story, this is an unthinkable demand. The father is expected to refuse. But to our great surprise, rather than being shamed and driven off the property, the father concedes to his son's request. That would not have been easy to do, to liquidate what he needed to give his son what he's demanding. Crazy, crazy generous. Imagine the gossip that would have started up about this. You know, somehow, I think the, you know, the public opinion today uh, probably would have been in his favor, unfortunately, that, you know, the twisted values of our culture, but not then. I mean, the tone of this story tells us that we should be questioning this father's wisdom. But I think the father probably knew some things that you and I don't. And though we uh, may all have opinions about how other people parent their kids, right? We aren't in their shoes. This father knew that his son was going to go. He was going to go off to a far off country. He was going to go and do his own thing. That's just how he was wired. And he knew that there were lessons that his son is going to have to learn on his own. He knew that at the same time, he needed to preserve peace in, 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 in the home. And he needed to protect his household from this toxic behavior from this younger son. So he gave him his inheritance prematurely. Now, maybe as a dad, this action is unthinkable. You'd never do that in a million years. You'd criticize any parent for being that permissive. But then maybe we're being harsh. Maybe you only wish your dad had been just a little more enterprising with you, a little less rigid, a little willing to make you, uh, let you make a few more mistakes rather than stifle your free spirit. Or that he'd, uh, he should have just let you, you know, go ahead and figure out life on your own a bit more. I think what Jesus is doing is preparing us to understand that no human father is going to measure up at all to God as our father, as best as we may try. Being a dad, you know, the territory comes with landmines. Forget trying to measure up to God. I mean, we often just don't measure up to our own children's expectations, kind of feel like, you know, uh, they, they want a Homer Simpson kind of dad. You know, the, the kind of dad that would tell his kids, I notice that all your friends have a hostile attitude. I like that. Yeah. Or, well, now that you're 13, princess, I, I want you to go start dating older guys. Uh, no son of mine is going to live under this roof without a facial piercing. Or, yeah, why do you want a job, son? I've got plenty of money for you to spend. Your mother and I, we're going to go away for the weekend. You might want to consider throwing a big party. Or, here's my credit card and the keys to my car. Go have a crazy time. And yet, one thing I think I, I'm sure we'll never hear our Heavenly Father say is, if you walk away from me, you can never come back. Whether you had a father that portrayed to you a poor model for understanding the fatherhood of God, or if he did his very best to model God's strong love, Jesus' story is for you. Dad will never be as generous as God in his love for you. Maybe that means you need to cut him some slack. But also, please, don't limit your perspective of God as your father by what you've grown up to see in the father that fathered you or the father models that you saw. Irma Bonbeck is a famous writer, columnist. She wrote this about her dad. She said, my daddy just didn't know how to show love. Uh, it was mom who held the family together. Uh, he just went to work every day, and, and when he came home, she, she just had this list of sins that we'd committed, and, and he would give us what for about them. I broke my leg once on a swing set. It was mom who held me in her arms all the way to the hospital. Dad pulled the car right up to the emergency door, and when they asked him to move it because the space was reserved for ambulances, uh, he shouted, well, what do you think this is, a tour bus? It seems all my life, you know, dad's just been parking the car someplace and coming in wet and half frozen. Dad was always just sort of out of place. You know, at birthday parties, he was just busying himself blowing up balloons and setting up tables and running errands. But it was mom who carried the cake with candles on it for me to blow out. 
I remember when mom told me to, you know, te wanted me to, uh, sorry, told him to teach me how to ride a bicycle. And so I, 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 uh, I told him not to let go, but he said it was time. And so I fell and mom ran and picked me up and he waved her off. And I was so mad. I showed him, I got right back on that bike and rode it all by myself. He didn't even feel embarrassed. He just smiled. And when I went off to college, he was just fiddling around with the luggage and the boxes. It was mom who sat down with me and told me that everything was just going to be all right. And she did all the writing and dad just sent the checks with a little note about how the lawn looked because I wasn't playing football on it. When I got married, it was mom who got choked up and cried and dad just blew his nose loudly and left the room. It seems all my life he just kept saying, you know, what are you doing? What time are you going to be home? Do you have gas in the car? Who's going to be there? No, no, you can't go. And No, not mom. She just loved me. But daddy, he just didn't seem to know how to show love unless is it possible he was showing it all along and we just didn't recognize it. I love that. Jesus told us about a father, a father that was generous beyond what was expected. And what a great model for some of us fathers who maybe just need to loosen up a bit, loosen up with our love, loosen up with our time, loosen up with our wallets, maybe a bit more willing to show love in ways that exceed our kids expectations. Third thing we see in the text that uh, this father gave his sons space when it was appropriate. He gave each of them space to be their own person. Uh, verse 13, again, not many days uh, later, uh, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. We don't hear about the older son, not until later in the story, right? And when his brother returns. But I'm sure that wasn't the first time he spoke up. I'm sure he stewed about this a lot. But so dad had to help each son find their way through this trouble. Of course, for the younger son, there'd be no turning back. He, uh, he would have to, he would have known that by his conscience. He would have understood that from their culture. He would have seen it in his father's eyes. He hopefully would have heard it in the clarity of his father's wisdom. But here's an important thing. A, a father needs to be able to communicate to his children that the choices they make will have consequences. So often we try to speak those words in a time of stress, in a time of emotional pain, and I, it doesn't always come out the right way. But a child needs to know that if their quest for freedom results in unwise or irresponsible actions. In fact, I think that's true at any age. They're going to have consequences. And a parent can't save the child from those consequences. They are really having to choose to face life on their own. And that's probably the hardest thing a parent can do to turn your children loose, right? I mean, remember the first day of school when you walked them to the bus stop and they watched them to get on? Uh, remember when they went to camp for that first time and they were gone for a whole week? Remember when they drove the car for the first time without you and you wonder if they come back in one piece? Remember when they went to college and you left them there in the residence? Remember when you walked your daughter down the aisle and gave her to a man that you knew wasn't good enough for her? We haven't crossed that road yet. Those are tough times in parenting. So if you have or had a father who is wise enough to turn you loose and let you become the person God created you to be, I hope you'll realize the generosity in that. I'm sure he wasn't perfect like our Heavenly Father is. Maybe he gave you more advice than you asked for and it just seemed a little bit more overbearing. You know, dads just do that. It's that protective thing inside of us and we're still working on it. But if, if you can, Thank your dad. Thank him for the ways that he learned to let go. Thank you for the space that he gave you to spread your wings and fly. Thank you for the way. Thank him for the way that he's been generous that way in your life. Well, let's continue on in the story. Uh, again, picking up at verse 13. But here we see that he was willing to forgive a serious offense and to move on. 
Verse 13, not many days later, the young son gathered all that he had, took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Often, um, men can seize up after enduring more than enough guff from, an, uh, from a, uh, a wayward child or rejection from a child. And, and more often than not, we are ready just to wipe our hands of that kid and let him or her live out their own mess. I mean, a dad's attitude in that frame of mind can, you know, we can end up saying things like, you made your own bed, you can sleep in it, don't come crying back to me. And admittedly, as dads, we get disappointed sometimes when our kids fail uh, to take our best advice, uh, to choose a plan that brings, uh, rather than good things that we want for them, that rather brings them emptiness and heartache. This boy came back having spent it all. Uh, his money, yes, his health, his dignity, everything. Squandered it. And we're not told how exactly. I mean, Jesus doesn't really give us any hint other than that he chose uh, a reckless, expensive lifestyle. He wanted a taste of living high on the hog, as it were. And his, his uh, critical brother later accuses him of, of uh, wasting his money on prostitutes. I kind of wanted to exaggerate his brother's failures. But that really tells us more about the older brother's attitude, his anger, more than anything else. All we know for sure is that the money was spent and not in particularly honorable ways, right? He didn't invest at all. He, he should have been wisely uh, purchasing, investing things that would establish himself as a respectable man. And, and now that's all gone. And, and then we read in verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, well, how many of my hired uh, servants, my father's hired servants have more than enough bread and I perish here with hunger. I'll arise, I'll go to my father. I'll say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. <laughs> well, it is complete desperation. Notice it says when he came to himself or when he came to his senses. And if we think, well, okay, he repented. <laughs> Not really. Um, feeding pigs only just reminded him of how far he'd fallen. It's kind of like this light bulb comes on in his brain. And he finds himself something like, don't. I'm such an idiot. You know, I, I hated home because I thought dad's rules were strict. I left home thinking that life on my own would be so much better. And here I am hungry and feeding pigs. I mean, for a Jewish young man, this is absolutely as bad as it gets. This is stupid. And uh, he returns. Uh, in a way, defeated and deflated. Uh, desperate to recover his money, but also he comes with his, you know, shoulders high and, and, and chest proud. And he was, he's going to come back and he's going to make a name for himself again. He's going to make up for his losses. He'll, he'll show his father. Well, the fact is the boy hasn't even considered his father's broken heart and the agony of rejected love that his father has endured. There's not repentance here, not yet. And so while having this conversation with himself in that far country, in that desperate state, there's really no, shame of, uh, no evidence of shame or of remorse here, only a quest to restore his own uh, honor, to, to save face, to try to get his life back together. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you stare at him in the mirror now and then. Are, are you hoping you'll earn points with God? You'll get your act together so that you can be presentable to God, receive His blessing, receive His commendation. You're thinking, you know, I don't need grace. I just need time. I, I'm not lost. I just haven't found my way yet. Please learn something right now about the Father's love and forgiveness. Because how you think God sees you, that's not how God sees you. That's not how He wants you. Listen to it here in verse 20. He arose, he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. <laughs> he hasn't quite caught it yet. But you know, the, the prodigal, you know, stealing his nerves, he's... He's not going to cry. He's not going to beg. He's not going to crumble. 
He's got a plan all laid out. He braces himself for this painful job interview with his father as he returns home spent and empty-handed and dying of hunger. But the father, oh. You know, listen, dads. Here's a cue for us. I think something that God wants to communicate to us about strong father love here. This father knows his son's going to return. In fact, he's waiting day after day, staring down that crowded village street to that road on which he saw his son disappear. And he realizes full well how others in the family regard him, how others in the community regard him. You know, they, they hope he's gone forever. And so the father also has a plan. He's going to reach the boy before the boy reaches the village, right? And that day comes and he sees his boy approaching. And listen, you know, if anything in that culture, the mother would run and wail and fall all over him and hug him and kiss him to death, but not the father. No, no, he would remain on the porch, right? He'd wait for his son to come and, and kneel and fall down before him and beg for mercy. But before the son has a chance to reveal his proud plan, right? Before, the, before anyone else has a chance to cast an opinion, the father sacrifices his reputation. He gathers up his robes. He breaks into a full run, shocked and nearly off, falling off his feet. The, the son is just hugged by his father and gathered in unashamed embrace and kissed in a sign of welcoming love. Forget trying to get through his little speech, right? The embrace of his forgiving father changes everything. And, and, and the boy's mind gets changed, melted in this moment of genuine repentance. He hasn't just come back home. He accepts that he's found. And dads, this may sound like the hardest thing we could ever do. But if maybe you've re rehearsed that fiery speech in your head, that, that all those things you're going to say to that child who needs correction and needs that what for, only to find that the child's waywardness has met with consequences that, that have been enough to crush him. Then it's not hard that, you know, to recognize that and say, you know, just trash the speech and affirm forgiveness. That's the point that a child needs to know more than anything, they need to know when, um, when all seems lost, that they've not lost your love. That you'd do anything to restore the relationship and close that gap between you. Our kids need that from their dads. Frankly, at almost any age, right? Um, so do you have a child who needs to receive that kind of strong love from you, Dad? And you know, we don't need to limit this to father love. Maybe you have a spouse that, that needs to experience a renewed heart of forgiveness, a reconciliation from you, a, a gesture, a step that closes the gap. Or, or a parent who's deeply hurt you, or a friend that's betrayed you. And it was a long time ago, and and the wounds have healed and you've kind of tried to move on, but love was lost and the gap remains. Pray about that, friend. Is there a step that you can take here? I know it's tough. It's tough to be that forgiving. But as I was preparing this message, I began to think about my dad and, and, and some of the things that I put him through. And I'm so glad my dad didn't shut me out. And so we see the dad's response. Again, verse 21, and the, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father <laughs> wouldn't hear it, right? The father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, a shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's eat and celebrate for this. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Remember, this story of a human father here is really a picture of our Heavenly Father. That's how God feels about you. He searched for you. He's waited at the gate 
time after time, look down those time-swept, dusty roads to see, is this the day that my son, my daughter, will return to me? And if you've been holding out on him in some way, will you just now see him for who he is as the God who waits and watches and then the God who runs to receive you? That's grace. Amazing grace. Nothing sounds sweeter. In spite of our rags and the lingering smell of the pigsty, the empty pockets, the faulty excuses, the broken promises, will you accept to be found by Him? If Jesus' story has touched your heart and, and remind you that it's time to stop running, stop hiding, stop trying to come back on your own terms, then stop now. Tell Him now. He's ready for you. Arms wide open. Well, there's a final characteristic we see here, and, uh, and that's that he loved his sons equally, even though he treated them and handled them differently. And we read that about the older son, particularly in verse 25 through verse 28. He's, he's stewing, he's steamed, he's bitter. He's, you know, this disowned brother, you know, that would dare come back and show his face around here again, much less have a royal party thrown for him. Like, what gives? And yet this dad is able to extend to him a deep, understanding love. And he does it for each of them in their unique way. The, the one stays and does all those everyday tasks and, and remains close to his heart and loyal to the household. And the other one has this wild streak in him and he goes to a far country. They are such different boys. You can't handle them the same way. You know what? The older son may not have gotten how much dad loved him. Never really appreciated it the way his younger son did or now does. All those things that he had done to break his dad, withdrawing from his father's love, wasting what his father gave him, violating all the values that his brother, father has taught him, that can really crush a dad. But then he returned and he sought relationship with his father again and he, re he respected his dad's authority and he came with a humble and positive spirit. You want to bless your dad? Those are things that can bring dad a lot of joy and charge up his batteries. And even if you know those rules and those values that haven't been broken for so, so long, uh, maybe it's just still time to remind him, dad, thanks for loving me through that. Remember, remember those days? Those days, I, 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 I really didn't deserve your love, but you gave it anyway. Thank you. Regardless of whether our children choose right or wrong, they still need to know that dad loves them. You have to love them the same, but you handle them in different ways. Kids don't want to be compared. They might compare to each other, but they don't want to be compared. And so what both sons needed to know is that they were uniquely and equally loved. We pick it up here again in the story. Verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, <clears throat> and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Quite literally, because everything left would be for the, for the older son. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Dads, these are not characteristics that we're going to get perfect. As you check down that list of qualities in the story of this dad and his boys, I, I hope you can see some of those happening in your life. And also that it might give you some ideas on how to be a stronger dad and, and close the gap or just, just be more like our Heavenly Father in the way that you love those that are in your family. And don't forget, God loves you too. And He doesn't want uh, just to love you from a distance. He wants to love you as a redeemed son who loves him back with all your heart. 
Take that to heart, Dad, as you enjoy Father's Day. God bless you all. Let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you for this amazing story. So many things that we can see in that story of your amazing love for us. Thank you for showing us dads what a father's love is like because you are so much like the father in this story. You've taken care of our basic needs. You are generous beyond our wildest expectations. You've given us space to be our own selves. You've forgiven us over and over again. And you love us all equally, even though we're very different. And so thank you, Father, that we have a Heavenly Father like that. Help us all, especially the dads here, to, to be like that too. Draw all of us to appreciate the ways that you, <clears throat> Lord, just desire to father us as your daughters and sons. Lord, would you stir in us a desire to come close and to remain close, to bring joy to your heart through the ways that we live. Father, I also just want to pray your blessing on, on families. Families who will maybe be able to get together in ways that they haven't been able to over the past few months of this pandemic. Um, Lord, just thank you for the ways that the restrictions are lifting. And we just pray for, uh, Lord, renewal in our homes and our relationships. We pray for your healing on our land. We need your help, Lord. And our needs are many, but you're a great God. So thank you for sustaining us in these challenging days. Help us to live to honor you. I pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of
Well, thank you so much for joining with us in this last hour. I just want to say that during this COVID time, the last three months, that uh, our lives have changed. We all know that. And the government has been doing what they think is the best to keep us all safe, to curb this, uh, this virus from spreading. And um, I'm glad that we are beginning to reopen. And with stage two uh, now in place for our province, uh, that means certain things for us to consider. The elders have met, we have prayed, we have uh, through counsel of one another and seeking for God's wisdom in the midst of all of this, uh, we, we've come up with three things for us as a church family. First one, the offices will remain closed. Uh, this means that uh, there'd be no visitations and no nothing at the church. However, the pastors are allowed to come into the office to do some work if they choose to do so in isolation in their own office or if they want to just come in and pick up some resources and take that home and to continue to work at home as they've done in these last few months. Another uh, thing that has happened for us before uh, COVID-19, the stage was under renovation and that had to be put on hold. Well now being in stage two, we can have a couple of people to come on in and to resume that work to try to get it all done for us for the fall. So we're excited about that. And then the third option, uh, third thing, is that we will be having our online services, just as you are watching today, uh, to continue throughout the summer. And we are planning and hoping that in the fall, we'll be able to get together and, and meet finally face to face. So continue to pray with us as, as the government gives out new things from one week to the next and as we uh, discern that and talk about it and uh, we look forward for the fall. Uh, just another announcement as well, Pastor Bruce is, is, and Michelle working on VBS, so we're excited to see all that come together. So continue to pray for them, for their creativity and the filming that they got to do to get everything ready to have it online for the children uh, very soon coming up. And then of course the last thing is just to say thank you so much for all your help and your gifts and your offerings. It allows us to continue to do church. Now we do it a little differently in the midst of this time, but we are so grateful to be able to do this, to bring it to you, and hopefully it, it has brought encouragement and uh, inspiration, and of course challenges as we hear from God's word for our lives. So again, thank you so much for joining us in this, uh, this hour, and uh, we'll see you next week. Now it's time to get back out there. Not always easy, is it? But uh, you guys take care, and again, we'll see you next week. Hi, boys and girls. This is Whitebeard, and I'm here to tell you about a VBS that's happening in Niagara Falls. And my friends, you don't want to miss this one. I'm going to be there every day. I'm the Pirate of Truth, and I'll be sharing with you. Stay tuned for more information and be ready to be pirates with me this summer. Arr. July 13th to the 17th. You don't want to miss it. Tune in every day to Grace Gospel's YouTube channel and you will see an adventure like you've never seen before. Tales of pirate friends who find the truth. Whitebeard signing off. Arr. Well, that sounds like a whole lot of fun. Thanks, Bruce, for that announcement of v about VBS. Thanks, Terry, for your announcements. It's just so great to have the different participants in our service today. Uh, next week, we look forward to some more of that. We'll have a testimony. We'll have some, uh, some a music presentation, a ministry and music. And so, yeah, looking forward to that. We're going to have our second part of a, what I'm calling Pandemic Perspective, the indispensable hope that we have in Christ as we uh, as we deal with uh, these uncertain times so look forward to seeing you being with you god bless you